Hey, Community of Hope family. Today, it's my privilege to introduce to you again, my best friend, Pastor George Acevedo. George pastors a multi-site campus on the west coast of Florida, directly across from Community of Hope. And they're doing tremendous things for God's kingdom on the west coast of our state. Uh, George has been my best friend since 1985 and a part of the covenant group that you hear me mention from time to time. I was reading recently that when we share our testimony, we are lending faith to those who hear it. And when we hear someone's testimony, we literally borrow faith from them. Well, George and his family have an incredible story, an incredible testimony they want to share that fits within our Miracle Series. And so I've invited him to come and share it with us. Take a moment and listen to his story. That's when I saw Zoe um, in a pool of blood behind the car. So I screamed, I picked her up, and um, I went to the only nice and safe people that we know in our neighborhood. I ran across the street, and I knew he was an officer, so he would have some ability to stay calm in a stressful situation. And uh, so I ran over, she was limp, she was crying, but she was limp and just blood everywhere. I look out the window and I see uh, my neighbor Courtney holding her baby and kind of turned her, she turned away from me and I started unlocking the door and she turned towards me and I could hear her crying, the baby crying. It's hard for me right now. She's holding her baby. It was, it was, I had the door open. She had blood all over her face. And I couldn't really tell what happened. But I couldn't get much from her. And when she came to me, she said I ran her over. So my first instinct was I grabbed the blanket and I put it on the ground. I started assessing her to see what happened. And then there's so much blood on her face, I couldn't see if there was any blood in her ears. And at first, I was in shock because I've never seen a kid so dramatically torn, like hurt like that. And she said, I don't know what to do, I'm lost. So I grabbed the phone, I called 911. We were airlifted to Tampa General. After we were there for five days, we were released to come home. And we've just been going to specialists and checkups since then, but she's fine. She's really gonna be okay. And so I think that if it wasn't for him knowing what to do and all of our family praying, I don't, I see the story going very differently so but yeah she's good <laughs> uh, community of hope would you agree with me that life is iffy uh, spell life with me l i f e there's a uh, an i f an iffiness of life i mean if, if you were to ask me if you would kind of hold me down and say george what's the one thing you've learned in your walk with god over the last two years uh, through addictions and accidents I would tell you that control is a myth. Life is iffy. Now, life's not only iffy, life is a contact sport. We, we bump into one another, isn't that true? We bump into one another, and when we bump into one another, we have a propensity to bruise and batter one another. Um, as a matter of fact, if you want to get a laugh after, out of Pastor Dale, when he's back next weekend, I want you to ask him about the Lake Talquin debacle that happened a number of years ago where Pastor Dale and I, even though we've been best friends for more than three decades, Pastor Dale and I almost went to fisticuffs. And I wanna be crystal clear, your pastor's tough, but I would whoop him bad, all right? So I would just hurt him bad. So, I mean, we bump into one another, and as bad as it is when we bump into one another, what happens when just ordinary life with its iffiness bumps into us? Think with me about you go to your annual physical for normal blood work and tests and all the rest, and then the doctor calls you back on your personal cell phone and says, I need you to come to the office right now. There's a bad diagnosis. What happens when you just kind of pack your lunch and make your way to, to work on a normal day for a normal day's work, to, for a normal uh, wage, and you get to work and the boss calls you in and says, we've reorganized slips the pink slip across the table to you and says, there's no place in our organization for you. 
What, what happens when, again, you get to work and, and you, you, you receive a packet of information from an attorney that you weren't expecting, that your spouse of decades says to you, I no longer love you and I no longer want to be with you. Or how about the knock at the door at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's a police officer to tell you about something that your teenage kid has done that's stupid or dangerous. Every one of those things happens to us and life bumps into us. And we, we who follow Jesus ought not to be surprised by this. Because Jesus told us it would be that way. Uh, look with me at the screen and on the notes. Uh, John chapter 16, uh, verse 33. Um, here's what Jesus said. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you, what's the next word? Will, will have trouble. Jesus didn't say you might. He didn't say you could. He didn't say you should. He said you will. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles. So that day in October, when a colleague said to me, you need to call home. There's been an awful accident with your granddaughter, Zoe. Cheryl and I and our family was getting ready to enter into, in this world, you will have trouble that Jesus spoke of. I was in North Alabama. I was speaking at a pastor's conference to about 250 pastors. I'd spoken on Sunday afternoon or evening, gone to bed, woke up that Monday morning. Uh, we were so far out in the sticks that our cell phone had no cell phone reception. But there was Wi-Fi in the place that we were staying. One of my colleagues, uh, Pastor Sherry, was there with me along with Pastor Wes. And, and Pastor Sherry said, George, um, I'm checking my email here, and it says there's been an accident with your granddaughter. Call home. So I had enough sensibilities to pick up the phone, and I knew that I couldn't call her, but I also knew I could wife, uh, do the, use the Wi-Fi and FaceTime with her. So my wife works in the same high school and sits in the same office as my daughter-in-law, who you saw on the video, Courtney. They're special education teachers. And so I pick up the phone to call Cheryl. I hit FaceTime. Cheryl's face comes on the screen. She's in a car. She is sobbing uncontrollably. She says, I'm on my way to the hospital. I said, what happened? She says, there's been an awful accident. Courtney ran over Zoe. I said, is she okay? She says to me, I don't know. I said, is she dead? And she says to me, I don't know. And with that, the screen went blank. My colleagues who were there with me, Pastor Sherry and Pastor West said, that I fell to the ground and what came out of me was something that sounded like an animal being killed. It was sobs and groans. I thought I was gonna throw up. I didn't know what to do. And then I kicked into this kind of panic mode. It was a PTSD thing. I, I, I said, I've gotta go. And I started to pack up all my stuff. My colleagues said, come, 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 we, we need to pray. And so they prayed for Lord Sabaoth to come and be with us. For the Lord to be our refuge, for Jesus to heal our precious little granddaughter Zoe. And so I made my way to Atlanta Airport a couple of hours away, flew to Tampa because Zoe and Courtney had been airlifted from Cape Coral, Fort Myers, all the way to Tampa, to Tampa General. And I'm here to testify this morning that five days later, my 18-month-old granddaughter left the hospital healed. Can we give God praise in this place this morning? Yeah. God, in his sovereignty and in his goodness, chose to bestow upon our family a healing. Pastor Dale wanted me to make sure I communicated this to you. Uh, there was uh, an unintended discovery that happened as a result of all the MRIs that she went through. They discovered my granddaughter, who had been struggling with sleeping, waking up with these headaches, screaming, and at 18 months, unable to communicate with us what was actually going on. They discovered that she had what's called a Chiara malformation at the stem of her, of, her, of her skull, and that it was causing this pain. They never would have discovered it had she not had the accident that led to the MRIs. Wow. And so then they had a little surgery, and she's been healed of that as well. Can we give God praise and hear it again? Yeah. 
Uh, Zoe is doing wonderful. She is mean and ornery as the day is long, and I love it. Here's a picture of us. We went to uh, Krispy Kreme. Look at her sticking out her tongue. She wouldn't even put her tongue in for Grandpa. We went to Krispy Kreme together a few weeks ago, and she's a wonderful child, and she's added such joy uh, to our life. And Cheryl and I give glory to God for that. Um, She is, and her story, her witness is a a testimony to what pastors Dale and Trevor have been talking about in these days here at Community of Hope. About this whole idea of miracles. Our our anchor text has been Ephesians. Look at your notes and on the screen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Why don't we read this together so that uh, I know that you're awake. How's that? All right, ready? Go Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is kind of like a doxological statement at the end of a long prayer that Paul prays. In that prayer, Paul prays that God's people would know the love of God and its height, its depth, its width, its width, and its breadth. He prays that they would know the love of God as all God's people should. And then he ends with this this kind of crescendo. You can kind of hear the symbols clashing. Now unto him who is able to do what? More than you could imagine, ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Pastors Dale and Trevor in these days have been teaching us about how we might trust God to do immeasurably more, more than we might even ask or think of. They've taught us, though, that as we study the miracle stories found in Scripture, the four biographies of Jesus called the Gospels, that as we read them, that we have to keep in mind that we want to learn from the patterns that we see in these healing stories, but we want to resist the temptation to make those patterns applicable to every circumstance in our current day lives. Because you see, that's not faith. Remember what the Bible says, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's not faith, that's voodoo, that's magic. When you can take some principle and apply it to every circumstance and get the result that you want, well, that's magic. That has nothing to do with walking by faith. Because here's what every one of us in this room knows. Uh, Billy reminded us of this just a moment ago. Every one of us knows because every one of us agreed that we've got our own share of stuff that we bring into this room. Can I get a big yes on that, right? That because we've got our own share of stuff that we bring into this room, every one of us knows whether we would put this language to it or not, that there is mystery to suffering. There's mystery to suffering. Now, some suffering, you can draw a straight line from A to B. If I've smoked cigarettes all of my life and I get lung cancer, it kind of sucks to be me, right? I mean, I did it to myself. You know, if if, if I eat too much food, I I gain weight. I did it to myself. Uh, Straight lines, no mystery. But then there's some suffering, like that day in October with my family. When my daughter-in-law, who loves her children, had four children from 18 months to eight years old, and she was trying to get them into the car, and for just a moment, she forgot that she hadn't put Zoe in her car seat, as she had done two and three times a day for week after week, month after month, year after year with those children. And just a lapse of memory, she forgot that she didn't put our precious baby in the car, and she hit her. How do you explain that? How do you explain that kind of mystery? There's no straight lines on that. And remember what Pastor Dale and Pastor Trevor have taught us. We we learn from the stories. Because we don't want to be guilty of what I want to call this afternoon the sin of presumption. The sin of presumption is presuming upon God that he's going to do things for us simply because we ask or make a request of him. Uh, Look at the way the psalm writer puts it, Psalm 19, verse 13. It's pretty straightforward. Also keep back your servant from, what's the word there? Presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. That means we we need to make sure that we don't live in the space where we begin to take over God's job. We don't let him be 
God. And yet, here's, here's the friend, here's, here's the, the truth I want us to get this morning. Even though we live with the reality of the mystery of suffering, listen to me, community of hope. We also want to believe in the possibility that God might perform a miracle in our life and in our circumstances. That indeed we serve the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we all might ask or even imagine. That there is at the same time, with the mystery of suffering, the possibility of miracles. Pastor Dale put it this way in the message a few weeks ago. He said, miracles are the inbreaking of a coming kingdom of God. Tragedy, loss, and death, and I would add, you know, accidents, addictions, and the rest, are the uprising of a dying kingdom of this world. There's this inbreaking of a coming kingdom of God and this dying kingdom of this world that, that sin and Satan and self are trying to overcome. And so, for many of us, with this tension, I want to suggest to us what our default is, is to what I want to call this morning or this afternoon, many of us in this room are practical atheists. Meaning, we confess Jesus with our mouth, but we push Jesus to the margins when it comes to the issues of our life. R.C. Sproul put it this way, he said, practical atheism appears when we live as if there was no God. It's, it's when we place ourselves, listen to me, this might be convicting to all of us. <laughs> we place ourselves at the center of the narrative of our life instead of God at the center of the narrative of our life. Let me give you a simple test. When you get a headache, what's the first thing you do? Pray or grab a bottle of aspirin? Come on, church. Okay? Because some of us, let's just admit it, you know, oh, the knee's hurting. Let me go grab some Tylenol. How about let's talk to Jesus first and then go get some Tylenol, all right? And so I, I found this, this blog this week that talked about practical atheism. It's a little long, but it's good. He says, Christians, if we're honest, there are times when, if we're not careful, we will live like fools, even when we say with our lips that God is there. When we live for ourselves, let's go through this little checklist. When we live for ourselves, when we act as though we solve all our own problems, come on, church. Uh, when we fail to trust God for the future, when we look for others to blame for our problems, when we act without prayer, we live as fools, as practical atheists. Sure, we acknowledge Jesus with our lips, but when the rubber meets the road, we deny Jesus by the way we try to handle everything on our own or refuse to try to do something that appears to be beyond our human abilities. You see, when it comes to these miracles that we've been studying in these days together as a church, when it comes to these miracles, we have to manage attention. Attention between the reality of the mystery of suffering that we all agreed is there and the possibility of miracles. Andy Stanley has famously said, there are problems we solve and tensions that we manage. You got a flat tire, you go get it fixed, problem solved. You got an unruly teenager at home, and you ask me, is it grace or truth? The answer is yes, right? <laughs> it's both. Sometimes you need to offer a little bit of grace, sometimes you need to beat the rascal. Okay, come on church. And it's it's a tension you got to manage, right? Can, would you agree with me? And so what I'm suggesting to us, that when it comes to this issue of the circumstances of our life, of the iffiness of life, of the suffering of life, we have to navigate suffering and miracles, the inbreaking coming kingdom of God, and the, and the uprising of the dying kingdom of this world. And I think the best way to deal with that is by what I want to call simply preparation. Preparation. Because we know, Jesus said it, there are going to be some iffy, full contact days in our life. Can we get a yes on that? Yeah. We know they're coming, so why not get ready for them? You see, here's what I've taught my people for now almost 23 years at Grace Church, and it's free to you, and you can write this down because I think this is worth writing down. What you do during days of peace and serenity will be what carries you during days of conflict and chaos. Let me say that again. What you do during days of peace and serenity will be what carries you during days of conflict and chaos. You see, we got to prepare for those iffy days, church. 
We got to get ready for those iffy days. Jesus says you will experience trials and tribulations. So why not get ready for them? Why not prepare for them? That's the question. How do I prepare for a miracle? And to do this, I want us to look at again, as we've been doing in these days, another miracle story. This time from Mark's biography of the life of Jesus, the gospel of Mark. Remember, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Juan, my cousin Juan. He wrote the last one, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, we're going to look at Mark, the shortest of the Gospels. And we're not actually going to look at the miracle. We're going to look at what happened before the miracle. So let's look at the screen and in your notes, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Let me read them for you. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are are forgiven. Now there's a lot in this story that we could get into, but I'm intrigued by several things that this story arises for me at least. How did these five friends hear about the miracle man named Jesus? We're not told. Uh, what gave them the confidence to bring their sick friend to Jesus? And then this one, how did they get so freaking bold that they ripped the roof off a home of a guy? It wasn't their home. And, and they dropped you in front of Jesus. And listen to me, church. This was before homeowner's insurance, all right? I mean, okay. And then, and then the last one, which I think is the most important one, how did they become such great friends that they were willing to be such risk takers, to do whatever it took to get their sick friend in front of the miracle man from Galilee? Uh, let me suggest to you that embedded in this story are two very simple truths that can help us as we prepare for our miracle. And number one, number one is this. I need friends who can passionately bring me to Jesus. Tap your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need friends who can passionately bring me to Jesus. Tell them to wake up. I need friends who can passionately bring me to Jesus. We all need these kind of passionate friends who can bring us to Jesus. Let me ask you, who are your redial friends? Who are your friends that you can call at three in the morning? Who are your friends that you can call when you get the pink slip, when you get the doctor's call, when, when, when the attorneys show up? Who can you call? And every one of us needs them. And I, I think these five friends were redial friends. Uh, look at, look at the, how Mark characterizes it in verses 3 and 4. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, uh, could not get to him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Listen to me. They weren't going to allow the crowd or the house to keep them from getting their friend in front of Jesus. That's how passionate kinds of friends they were. Once my son who I'll tell you about a little bit later, was standing before a judge in Ocala. I had a meeting I could not get out of. And your pastor drove four hours to stand in front of a judge to testify of our home. <clears throat> because he's that kind of passionate friend. Another one of my friends, the morning after my son overdosed and after preaching three services at his huge church in Tampa, drove all the way across the state to spend five minutes with us praying for us. Because you know what? Good friends know when to come and good friends yeah. know when to leave. Yes. Yeah. Who are those kinds of passionate friends in your life? Mm. Kathy Copan breaks her neck to create space, a community of hope for everybody to be connected. Because everybody needs to have somebody who not only knows their name, but their nickname. I know that here at Community of Hope, uh, you guys work overtime to make sure everybody gets connected. But I would tell you, uh, Pastor Dale is watching right now online. There's still too many of us who call Community of Hope our spiritual home who are not connected. You don't have redial friends. 
When, when, when Zoe's accident happened and I got off the plane, a covenant brother met me when I got to the airport. Your pastor was there along with the other covenant brothers, along with my bishop, along with my superintendent, along with many, many of our friends from Southwest Florida. And throughout the days and weeks of Zoe's stay, they were there with us. They were the passionate friends who were willing to do whatever it took to get our sick, paralyzed family in front of Jesus. And let me ask you to be honest with yourself. Who does that for you? Who does that for you? John Wimber is the founder of the Vineyard Movement, and, and he believes in what's, believed in what's called power evangelism. He's now gone to heaven. And, and he said that, you know, uh, the Bible tells us in James chapter 5 that we can lay hands on one another. And, it, you know, I mean, it's if somebody's sick, if somebody's broken, they just invite the leaders, they lay hands on them. And, you know, to let somebody touch you appropriately, you know, take some trust. And John Wimber said this, he said, when you pray for somebody, when you lay on hands of somebody and you pray for somebody to be healed, you anoint them with oil, he says, you know what the worst thing that can happen to that person, even if they don't get healed in that moment, he said, the worst thing that happens is that person knows they're loved by somebody. What if every person who called Community of Hope their spiritual home lived in such connectivity to other passionate followers of Jesus that everybody knew? They were loved. Yes. Would that change West Palm Beach? Yes. Yeah, would. Number two. Number two, how do I prepare for a miracle? Number two, I need friends who are not only passionate and can be my passionate friends. I need friends who can have faith for me when I cannot have faith for myself. Yeah. You know, there are some remarkable Christians out there. I'm not one of them that when struggles and heartaches and the iffiness of life and the contact sport of life comes, that their faith is up and to the right. Mine typically is down and to the left. And I want you to know that I'm in good company. Don't feel bad for me because one third of the Psalms are what we call Psalms of laments. And you know what Psalms of lament are? They're basically this. Hey, God, why this? You know, that's an honest prayer. Hey, God, why this? I've had it many, many days in my life. I've had it many, many days as we've journeyed through uh, life together. And here's the deal. The Bible says we need friends who can have faith for us when we cannot have faith for ourselves. Look at verse 5. When Jesus saw, what's the next word? Their faith. Circle the word their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now stay with me on this one. These four friends are lowering their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus. He gets down in front of Jesus. Jesus looks up. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw the four friends' faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. You know, sometimes in the Bible, Jesus heals because of the person who needs the healing and their faith. And sometimes he heals because of the faith of other people who have faith for that person, like in this story. And sometimes it's apparent, it's apparent that nobody has faith. And yet Jesus chooses to heal. We can't put God in a box, but let me just say this. When we are having difficulties in life, you need somebody who's going to have faith for you when you cannot have faith for yourself. So who of you, in the constellation of your relationships, who have you given such entree into your life, such trust into your life, such portals of love into your life, that they can have faith for you when you cannot have faith for yourself? Now, remember, in all of this, we're trying to manage the tension between the mystery of suffering and the possibilities of miracles. Because let me tell you the other side of the coin of Zoe's healing. At the same time that Zoe was, had the accident and was healed and in recovery, our 31-year-old son, Nathan, was arrested for the fifth time and sent to jail, spending Christmas and his birthday in jail once again. The mystery of suffering, alongside the possibilities of miracles. See, we have two sons. Daniel's 35, married to Courtney, gave us four amazing grandchildren. And then Nathan is our 31, this Valentine's Day, just in a few days, our 31-year-old precious, artistic innovative son. Love them both. Love them deep. And from the time he was 16 to two years ago, he's only been sober and clean for two years, to two years ago, 
Our life has been arrests, rehab, kicking him out of the house, homelessness, drug overdose, suicide attempts, arrests, rehab, drug overdose. Fifteen years of that. Fifteen years of living in the, the mystery of suffering. The same boy who was raised nine inches, that's the width of the wall, between his brother who loves Jesus, who married his youth group sweetheart, who gave us the most beautiful grandbabies in the world. I mean, nine inches apart. Miracle on one side of the wall. Suffering on the other. And it's a tension that Cheryl and I have learned to manage, and, and there have been many instructors along the way, but I want to tell you about one before we close. Her name is Patty, Patty Namazi. She's one of our pastors at our Sarasota campus. And Patty is an amazing woman of deep faith. And she, um, she was in Nicaragua with our Nicaragua mission team. She loves to pray. And so after they got done doing their activities, uh, one, late one afternoon, she says, I'm going to the mountain to pray. And kind of like Moses, she went up to the mountain to pray. She came back almost walking on clouds. She said, Jesus met me on the mountain. You see, she had a son named Robbie who's about the same age as our son named Nathan, and he struggles with addiction just like Nathan. And she's been praying and pleading God to heal him and deliver him just like we have for Nathan. And she says, Jesus spoke to me on the mountain. And we said, what did he say? And here's what she said. Here's the lesson. She said, Jesus told me, Patty, stop pleading and start praising. Amen. Stop pleading for Robbie. Start praising me for what I've promised you I will do in Robbie's life. And it's changed everything for Cheryl and me. We've quit pleading to God to do it. We started praising him for what he has promised he will do because we serve the God who is able to do infinitely more beyond anything that we could even ask or imagine. And that's why we sang this morning, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. You see, when unbelief starts pressing in on me and saying, death is going to take your son, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Because listen, I don't fight on my own. Heaven comes to fight for me. So when you go to the Old Testament, and they're getting ready to go to war. More times than not, they put the praise band out front. Sorry, Billy. Because before you go to war, you got to learn to adore. You adore before you war. And friends, some of us falsely think we leave our sufferings out there in the parking lot. I'm inviting you to go get them now and bring them into this room. Because in this room... Together, we have faith for one another. And in this room, we raise a hallelujah in the presence of our enemies. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Before we go home, we're going to raise a hallelujah one more time. And here's what I want to invite you to do. Not just sing a song. I want you to make this your prayer. Make it personal. We all agreed. We tricked you. We all agreed. We got our bag of suffering, right? Can I, can, I, can I get a yes on that one? And so we're going to sing it and bring it before Jesus and say, Jesus, I am going to sing a melody because my melody is my weapon. So let's stand. Worship team's going to lead us. We're going to sing together. The worship team is here. The prayer teams will be in the corners. If you want somebody to pray with you, they'd be glad to pray with you. They want to lay hands on you and pray for you, all right? So let's pray. Jesus, we invite your spirit into this place. Some of us today are agonizing over the suffering of our life. We were tempted to leave it out in the parking lot, but we bring it in here with you and with one another. And in this space and in this place, we raise a hallelujah. In the midst of the mystery, we raise a hallelujah. Because fear, it has no place in me we raise a hallelujah because all of heaven comes to fight for me and so Lord help us help us to 
manage the tension between the mystery of suffering and the possibilities, the possibility of miracles. And let us do that even now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen. All right, church, it's time to practice what I've been preaching. All right, let's sing.